Well, it's an absolute honour to be asked to chair this evening's event. Professor Rita Jackerman is really eminent in the field of thinking about psychosocial issues for young people living in the occupied territories. She's going to talk tonight about psychosocial health of Palestinian youth, occupation and resistance. And this is the fourth event in the Friends of Bazaar University's Education, Occupation and Liberation Programme. And uh, I, I invite you all to give her a very warm welcome for the work she does, as, for, as well as for what she's going to say tonight. Thank you. I'm humbled by all this, I must say. I'm a very simple person. And I must say that I need to thank Palestine and Birzeit University for having given meaning to my life through work. So, in fact, all the credit goes to the Palestine Question and also Birzeit University for giving the space to be able to do something of meaning every day. And I would like to say that I'm very happy to be here because I see friends, colleagues, people in solidarity, and it's, wow, uh, heartwarming, to say the least. Let's go to what we would like to do today. There are two issues that I would like to interlink to each other. The first issue is looking at data we're still analyzing uh, on youth mental health uh, and also the relationship of youth to the broader context around them. And then I would like to use the opportunity to raise another issue, which is what we have been developing, a conceptual framework that helps explain why uh, uh, the, the fate or the predicament of Palestinians in ways that we think are better than the standard ways in which we are explained. So to begin with then, we're doing, we, ha we did a study in 2016, it was called Power to Use, supported by the European Union, it was a combination of different uh, regional uh, countries uh, which made it not possible for us to add into the study uh, questions related to uh, exposure to political violence. We couldn't do that. However, it was a three-year program and it was generally looking at empowering youth and also uh, investigating whether youth felt included or excluded from within society. And of course, we had European partners with us. Now, for each country, we had three levels. One is the macro level, where there was, it was desk work, policy work, etc. Meso level, which was largely qualitative, and micro level, which is in the West called individual, we call personal, there's a big difference. Individual level, where we look at the details of persons and see how those relate to the larger context or to their well-being. Uh, for the micro level, uh, we had a nice sample, not too big, not too big, but enough to be able to try to develop some analysis as to why they report what they report. And it was a representative sample of young people 18 to 29 years. Um, you know that uh, youth are defined in various ways. <clears throat> 15 to 24, 18 to 29, 18 to 39. And not only this, they are called youth, and I am critical of that, because it's as if youth is a class in itself. And it isn't a class in itself, because young people are, are divided not only by class, but also by gender. However, they are called youth worldwide, so we'll call the youth temporarily, but thinking that we should be critical about that notion, because they're not one homogeneous blob. So we did that in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and then we looked, this is a sample characteristics. There's nothing unusual there, except that we had a larger proportion of women compared to men, and that's understandable. You can find women easier when you do surveys. 
uh, they are much more frequently at home, men are much more outside the home, especially if they're young people. <coughs> and the rest is basically typical of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, except that notice that 72% were not working at the time of the survey. And I would like to note that according to the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, 55% of young people who have um, bachelor's or higher degrees are currently unemployed. A very high proportion of unemployment among young people. And it's a really very big problem, which raises the question uh, conceptually about youth, what is considered youth, as a transitional period, which is biological, going and also social, going from childhood into adulthood, where in our case, the transition has no end in sight. Because if you cannot work, you cannot get married, you cannot move out of your parents' house, you cannot have a family, and you cannot go on with life as an adult without working. Which, and that is a very important issue that we have to face in Palestine. What do we do with this category called youth, which is going to be in transition for a very long time? So that was one interesting thing that we raised during this study. Now, we also looked generally at the general demographic and now socioeconomic characteristics. Nothing unusual there. 50% refugees, <coughs> urban areas, rural areas 15.5. This is confounded by Gaza, because in the Gaza Strip, hardly 5% of the population live in rural areas. The rest are mostly living in refugee camps and in urban areas. It's heavily urban. And then <coughs> we asked them about their family economic status. In Palestine, if you ask people, how much money do you make, nobody will answer you. <laughs> Avoiding tax, being afraid. I mean, tax which is not used for the people, but tax that goes away somewhere else. So why should they pay tax? <coughs> we all want to pay tax, provided it comes back to us. But if the tax disappears somewhere else, then the question is raised, why should we pay it? So people avoid it. You don't ask them. But you ask them. <coughs> Compared to the people around you, how do you define your, the economic status of your family? Is it above normal, normal, or below average? And what we found was quite striking is that almost half uh, reported that they are in a below average situation. And that's likely the effect of the Gaza Strip. Then we asked about self-rated health. Now, self-rated health is um, defined, and we'll talk about this a bit later, as a soft measure of health, not hardcore. And they call it subjective measure of health because you ask people simply, how do you rate your health? It includes the voice of people into the assessment, not only the doctor. And just because of that, it is no longer objective. Even though in the literature, we know repeatedly that what is called these self-rated health, etc., the subjective uh, ones can predict death and disease. Consistently, they do that. Now, I'll explain later why is it that we focused on self-rated health and also well-being, as you can see. So, we looked at self-rated health and because health, sihha in Arabic, is seen primarily as physical health, then a very low proportion, less than 10%, reported that their physical health is below good. However, when we looked at well-being, and in Arabic it's al-afiyah. And al-afiyah in our tradition is a combination, and Cynthia knows that very well because we've worked together on things like that. It's a combination of physical, <coughs> social, psychological. In fact, in the local understanding, the local way of understanding health, 
This was known way before WHO defined it as there's some total of whatever. So we've known that all along. And if anything, the uh, advent of biomedicine and the Western conception of health began to eradicate this until WHO came back and said, oh, wait a minute, let us rethink this concept. And now it's beginning to come back. In any case, uh, uh, over a third of the young people uh, reported that they have low well-being, i.e. they live in ill-being. And that's an important question. How come? What is it that the Rafi has been negatively affected to? We'll get to it in a bit. And then when we, we looked at self-rated health uh, by selected indicators, simple numbers, not regression right now, but simple numbers, uh, looking at cross-tabbing, looking at are there differences between these reports among these people and selected demographic and socioeconomic factors. And we found something that you would expect, some that you don't expect. Uh, Ill-being rises with age. And of course, more unemployment, more responsibility. Of course, you expect that. What we did not expect is that ill-being rises with those who are married. Now, could it be financial responsibility? What other responsibility? I mean, we did that later. I'm not going to tell you about But it, it, so marriage is not necessarily good for your well-being in our context. I'm not saying that for everybody, but in our context, it's not necessarily good. And then, uh, as expected, you can see that the more educated have better well-being. You would expect that. And probably the more educated, despite the, the uh, unemployment, etc., are more likely to rationalize or be involved in politics or something like that. There are reasons. We will talk about that later. Now, of course, we expect lower uh, well-being among those who are poorer. And we expect um, crowding rate is a proxy for poverty. The more crowded, the more ill-being. Then we said, OK, let us look at what is called satisfaction, basic satisfaction. And some results are typical, and other results I was frankly quite shocked by. Those who are not satisfied with their housing are at about a bit than a quarter. Those who are not satisfied with their neighborhood, 20%. Those who are not satisfied with the government's effective work to give them employment, the majority. Those who are not satisfied with trade unions to find employment, very high, more than three quarters. And those who are not satisfied with the way in which the country is being governed, more than two thirds. And I was shocked by this one. I couldn't believe it, actually. And we're still trying to understand. A third are not satisfied with life in its entirety. And the question is why? Again, with housing, the same thing. Well-being, and it's the same exact pattern. So then we said there must be intermediate factors <coughs> between the demographic and the education and the well-being and the self-rated health that can buffer i.e. modify or make worse these young people's situation. And then we said, OK, let's see. Let's see if we can look at how much they trust different aspects of their community, etc. The results were very shocking. As you can see, the large majority reported that you need to be very careful OK, about people you meet, you know, etc. The large majority trust their families. But look, suddenly you go to the extended family and the trust goes down. And then look, uh, it's also down for neighbors. 
It's even worse for people they know personally, and it's even worse for trusting other religions, and again, other nationalities. So the situation is one where there's very little trust that these young people exhibit. And so we looked at these trust indicators, and what we found is what we expected, which is that the less trust, the less well-being. As simple as that. These are the numbers here. The less trust, the less well-being. So this then led us to say, OK, let's look. Does this have to do with politics? And we had about eight questions related to the political uh, situation there. For example, confidence, trust in government, uh, trust in the law, trust in the police, trust in the legislative council, trust in political parties. There were eight questions. And usually, when there are several questions, uh, uh, actually, it's important to ask these several questions. The reason being is that normally we are in public health and in the end we measure. We crunch numbers. We don't just do theory. We have to crunch numbers, although we are in multidisciplinary public health. But basically, when you want to measure a phenomenon, you don't use one variable only. Because look at this table. It has different dimensions. If you look that way, it will look one way. Here it will look another way and so on. And so what you do is you put together several set uh, questions and then you check whether what is called the inter-rater reliability, i.e. you check whether these groups of questions fit together or measure together what we, inten what, what we think we are measuring. So you do factor analysis, you do the alpha. And uh, if they are together, then we know that the alpha is high, for example, which is a very good alpha, meaning that, yes, these questions uh, measure something that we think is together in itself. Whether it is what we, we, we are measuring in fact or not, that's another question. But at least we know that we're measuring something that together makes a phenomenon, domain. and then. We looked and we said that, and look, about almost half have no confidence at all huh, in any of the uh, yeah, governmental systems. And then 32% went to three confidence levels, and then 25% four or eight of them. But almost half have no confidence in any of the arms of government, any of the institutions of government. So we caught on to this, and we forgot a little bit about the well-being, because we're still in the, and we said, goodness, uh, how do we explain this? This is something that we need to know. Who are these people who have no trust in any of the institutions of the government? So that's what we went with regression to, you know? So regression is a way, um, it's a statistical method that will allow us, as we call it, to check for confounders, i.e. to make sure that th this phenomena is associated with that phenomena without having something else that would modify or change the relationship. And so uh, we f before doing regression, we said, OK, Let's see, um, sele uh, let's see about well-being. And of course, those who don't have any confidence at all had less well-being than those who are more confident. Mm -hmm. It's understandable, as expected. And then, with regression, we got some interesting results, which is uh, the, all, the younger you are, OK? the more confidence you have in the institutions of government. And this is understandable because once you graduate, you cannot work, you cannot do this, you cannot marry, and then you begin to face the problem. And when you're a student at Birzeit University or any other university there, you're still living in the student, uh, what do you call it, dream life? Because once, <laughs> once you're out, 
It's a really serious <coughs> situation. Okay? We also, of course, expected West bankers had better confidence than Gazans. What do you expect? Of course. Of course. Uh, and also, those who have better income had more confidence expected. Also, those who felt safe had more confidence. It depends on your neighborhood. Whether you're safe or not depends on which neighborhood you live. Those who thought that Wasta, Wasta is, uh, what do you call it, Wasta in English? Nepotism, Nepotism cronyism, etc. That you, you don't really need Wasta to get uh, work, felt better than those who thought Wasta is needed to get work. Okay, so it, it directly linked to their well-being, okay? And, and to their, uh, sorry, and also to their well-being, but also to their uh, trust with government. And also, youth who reported that uh, young people are active in public life felt better, right, about government than those who thought, oh, youth are not doing well at all because they're not active in public life, and so on and so forth. We looked in a post-survey to try to explain some of the results with qualitative work. One, the participants were not surprised at all by the fundings. Oh, of course. So it was like an uh, endorsement. OK? Uh, they, the young people thought that a main reason for the lack of confidence in government is the split between Fatah and Hamas. OK? And they really uh, discussed the uh, political parties negatively by stating that uh, they uh, their main interest is during elections. They take care of us. In fact, they give them money, they give them mobile phone cards, etc., to go elect. And once the elections are over, bye-bye, and young people are forgotten. And it happens quite often. Okay? And also they noted that government is corrupt, etc. Also, not only uh, look, um, the big government, the local government as well, with nepotism, wasta, political leadership, for, focusing on their uh, interests rather than the people. And it's all something that we have lived with and we, we can endorse through daily life, of course. It's not, that the, it's not a figment of their imagination. It is a general feeling from um, uh, the population at life. But the conclusion was quite remarkable. I didn't, I didn't uh, put in all the data, but the conclusion was quite something else. Uh, one, they report a strong sense of exclusion and low what is called linking social capital. You know about social capital, but linking social capital is basically trust in government. Okay? Uh, but this is as far as the Palestinian uh, governmental system is concerned. Okay? But they do not feel excluded when it comes to Isra the Israeli military. You know why? Because everybody is excluded <coughs> together. So as we say in Arabic, death with the collective is a blessing. So they didn't feel excluded. Okay? So we understood from this that <coughs> there are different domains for exclusion. And that we cannot look at exclusion as a homogeneous block. There's the Palestinian domain and there's Israeli occupation. And one wonders about what other youth in other countries uh, think in terms of exclusion. Do they think in terms of one domain, only country, or do they think exclusion in multiple domains? I don't know. It's worth looking at and comparing one day by doing cross, you know, studies across different countries. OK, now what is important <coughs> is that our People, our young people, uh, believe that while they are excluded because of Israeli military occupation, okay, uh, the internal workings are what is most important, but this has not stopped them <coughs> from doing other things. Now, so, intricate mix between demographic, economic, political, etc., that all together make up 
the psyche, the psychological state of Palestinian youth, which is bound to affect even their physical health, not only their mental health, and I explain in a bit. <clears throat> so, a uh, low level of exclusion is associated with ill being, lack of trust, lack of space for participation actively in whatever life, social, economic, etc., and local government. However, the point is that the main issue that they talked about also is that they have no trust in the Palestinian government also because it's unable to do something effective about Israeli military occupation. But although they are excluded and they endure uh, what we call a triple captivity, which is the captivity because of occupation, captivity because of Hamas, and captivity because of a Palestinian authority, but somehow they are able to sustain a level of activism against Israeli military, which is remarkable. And you can see them on checkpoints. You can see them in Gaza. And they are doing that despite the authorities in a leaderless revolt. These kids do not want to be in political parties, do not want to be given orders by anyone. And there's a question there. They do not want to organize. And I'm a traditionalist, <laughs> maybe. I think for political growth and resistance, somehow in the end you need some organization. But they don't want organization. They don't want leaders. And they will go to the checkpoint and come back whenever they want. Some people believe, some researchers believe, that this is an intifada. It's a third intifada, but it has different features from the standard. Where it's not sustained like that, it comes and goes in line with what these kids decide on the spot sometimes. On the spot sometimes. And this is how it looks like. It's just remarkable. I mean, they are daring these kids. Take a look. Isn't this cheeky? <laughs> I mean, it's in the midst of the, this is Bethlehem, in the midst of such tear gas, and there he is sitting down saying, "Hey, I'm here." You know, it's it says something about uh, daring. I mean, you could have been shot. Women at the checkpoint, an increasingly common phenomenon, and this is our alumnus Amal. Amal was simply holding the Palestinian flag in Jerusalem. And you know what happened? They beat her up like that, and this picture went viral. So <laughs> it went all over the place. Some people wrote her. It was really something. And Ahed from Gaza, 22-year-old, holding the Palestinian flag. This one went really viral because it reminded people of Delacroix's 1830 painting, Liberty Leading the People. There you go, Liberty Leading the People. So that's Ahed. Now, do I have more time? Yeah, because it, the, why are we sticking why are we talking about well-being and self-rated health? And it's a long story. And Derek Summerfield over there changed our life. And let me tell you why. Uh, you know about Palestinians 48, 65, etc. For the longest time, the West thought we needed food, shelter, etc. But that, we didn't have a psychology. That's all they gave us, food and shelter, etc. And then in the late 80s, beginning 90s, suddenly Palestinians were discovered as having a psychology and that they are traumatized <laughs> by that experience. And then suddenly, more suddenly, the trauma industry was hurled at us by the mid-90s. And you know what happened? The Palestinians caught it like you wouldn't believe. 
The reason being is that they wanted to be placed in the category of human. And so that was fortunately, but unfortunately, this led to, this is Derek's words, and I've been using them ever since, the biomedicalization of distress. Now, we were working on mental health at the time. <clears throat> we didn't have access to the literature because it was too expensive. And it took us till 2002 to, through Hinari, the World Health Organization's um, search engine, to be given to us free of charge. And then we began to read the literature and we bumped on Derek. That's <laughs> and Derek said things uh, in his two or three articles in the BMJ, War and Mental Health, which not only rang a bell, it told us that why we feel uncomfortable is exactly that reason, which is uh, what is happening is that trauma is now turning into a biomedical issue. And the minute you pathologize social suffering like that, then what happens is that the net result is that they're going to give you medications or therapies or whatever without taking into consideration the cause of the trauma to begin with, which is justice, injustice. So, and I will never forget that. And then we met in person, right? And you came to Birzeit. And it was quite remarkable because he said it in words, it couldn't have been better said. Uh, we knew it, but it's, and we realized it, but he said it and we've been using it. We used it till the hilt. <laughs> so, now, the other thing that we need to note is that, so that's one category, and we did not want to be just seen as pathologies. There was, we were not mad. We're just, uh, we're, we're suffering trauma, and that's a different sort of thing. The other thing that biomedicine does is that it categorizes into dichotomies. It divides either you're sick or you're not sick. And we know from my grandmother and your grandmothers that it doesn't go like that. Afie is about a continuum between ease and disease. And every day is another day. <clears throat> and not only this, that you are exposed to insults uh, every day, or they get better or they get worse. And it varies. It's never just like this or like that. And in fact, my mother and my grandmother, and I'm sure your grandmothers, you will ask them, how's your health today? She will use a million and one words. I have about 70 words right now on the ease, disease continuum. She would say, Mish battali, not bad. She would say, unable, I'm unable to function. She would say, Mish mabsuta, I'm unhappy. Unhappy means sick. In, in our language, unhappy, it means that you might, or, Mish mabsuta. You, it could be sick, it could be whatever, but it's a physical manifestation of a mental health state and so on. Okay, so I have some 70 of those. I'm sure you have from your, if you remember or if you have, um, if, you, if you have tried to investigate, you will know that there are words that people use that doctors will negate. So you are not sick no matter what you say because they, they cannot diagnose what the problem is. So. Also, we began to notice that you go back and forth between the East disease continuum. It's not like vectors. It doesn't go in straight lines. It's all over the place. And if the insults are heavy enough, then you might get into the disease part of the continuum. OK? You might, but you might not. It all depends. It depends on the resources available to you also. The resources available to you, like community solidarity, is so important. Isolation is so problematic. There are many explanations for why some people heal within community quickly and others do not heal. And then, so we said, look, objective measures of health, the so-called objective, are all good, but they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. That's the first thing to say. Necessary, but not sufficient. That's an age-old epidemiological principle that we're using also here. And we're saying death, injury, disability, disease are not 
sufficient to explain the Palestinian predicament. We're sick and tired of being seen either as mad or crazy and requiring medication, when actually what we need is um, world-level solidarity to remove the injustice we live in daily. And this is when, between Derek uh, and Duncan Pedersen and Vina Das and Arthur Kleinman, so we began to go into the anthropological part. We, and that's all because WHO gave us the chance to read the literature. <laughs> so, uh, and our publications rose quite a bit since that time because we began to see the literature. What's interesting is that together what happened is that we began in public health, we are, um, it's a month. Public health is a field of inquiry. It's, it's not a discipline for us, multidisciplinary public health especially. So what you do is that you take concepts and ideas from different di disciplines, anthropology, sociology, medicine, whatever, and you, 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 you yank them, squeeze them, etc., and then whoop, you come up with an idea and you develop metrics and you check whether the metrics do what they want you to do or what you think you want them to do. And so from anthropology, economics, social science, etc., we began to develop a domain which we call the, social, the suffering domain. Suffering of war. Uh, the anthropologists called it social suffering. We call it political suffering and maybe social too, so we kept it as a suffering. And the suffering domain <clears throat> is what we call the invisible wounds inside, the trauma of war that you cannot see, but over the life course can lead to disease. And all of us are living with this trauma of war daily. And we might all look normal, but there's something, there's a wound there that makes us slightly different. The wound of having experienced whatever it is, not only death, injury, uh, imprisonment, uh, how homes destroyed or bombs nearby. In my view, something that really affects Palestinians quite negatively is how at some point they're unable to, to protect their children. I mean, uh, I think it's a most difficult, I've been through it too. Mm. It's a most difficult, it's a most difficult feeling of when you know that you can't protect your children from trauma. Uh, and if you talk to Palestinians, mm, my goodness, I mean, almost everybody has had that experience. So anyway, the suffering domain is about exposure to political violence and we have scales now developed for exposure to political violence and it's about being directly exposed and about witnessing. And directly exposed is not, li not only what is called individual, it is also, it is, it's also collective. <coughs> so there's, for example, crossing the checkpoint uh, to Birzeit University from 2000 to 2004 on Gao Jout Road, that was collective exposure. They didn't know you from Adam. They threw tear gas at everybody. Collective exposure negative health outcomes, even if you witness, even if you witness, you would have neg negative health outcomes, okay? Human insecurity, uh, <clears throat> UNDP was talking left and right about uh, human insecurity, so we developed a scale from the bottom upward. We would start with qualitative methods, and then we'd go up and we built a scale, and now it's being used in uh, somewhere in um, uh, Himalaya, <laughs> Kashmir, etc. And then somebody else is using it in, um, in, um, in Lebanon. And I want to tell you, yes, Palestinians can produce and do produce knowledge. There is no reason to think that we always have to swallow knowledge which comes from somewhere else. Of course, we have difficulty publishing as a result, but that's OK. And with, with time, we're getting to publish. For example, we, we developed a humiliation measure, and it was published. And we give, and by the way, we give our measures free of charge. I was shocked in the United States, you have to buy the measures that people, academics produce. It was really sad. <laughs> wow. OK, so uh, we developed these measures, human insecurity, 
Uh, ambiguity not yet, uncertainty, we're working with Alessandro on that now. <clears throat> Humiliation, we did deprivation in the process of analyzing the data. Silencing is very important. And I think whoever is crushed as a people will know that silencing is very bad for your health. And silencing means many wounds inside. And so many times as Palestinians we were silenced. And then violations of human rights, all sorts of violations. So that's the suffering domain. And then there are, of course, the subjective measures of health, <coughs> well-being, quality of life, self-rated health, different types of somatization, and so on. We have a scale for that, because also somatization and behavioral change, it's culturally specific. You can't use uh, somebody else's. Uh, we tested. It didn't work. So we did from the bottom up, <coughs> etc. And then. We said, all of this is into something we call the political determinants of health or the political domain. And we, we maintain that WHO did not go far enough. <coughs> WHO stopped at the social determinants of health. And we're saying, oh no, we know from experience and from reading, it is the political determinants of health. Wars, conflicts, biopower, biopolitics, Foucault. Uh, yeah, necropolitics, Mbembe, who can live, who can die. <coughs> racism, racism, distribution of power and money, class, patriarchy, global market forces, global and country specific policies, internal conflict, all are the political determinants of health, which determine the social determinants of health. And of course, there is biological predisposition. So this is how we now conceptualize health in war. And by the way, quite often <clears throat> in the local tradition, we don't uh, divide mental health from physical health. This is about health. And you might have mental health symptoms, but they can beca become physical. Mm -hmm. So this is how we see it. We see that this is ultimately determinant and it can determine directly subjective measures, social suffering, and towards the objective measures. Or you can have social suffering affecting subjective measures and to objective measures. And that's it. Thank you.